There's Christmas dinner, boys and girls. Here comes a shooter. Shooter. Big buck. Well, I'll be at Rudolph himself. Get the camera. If that ain't Santa, I'm shooting. What would you like for Christmas? The dirty point buck. That ought to do it. If we shoot anything else in this intro, we're going to start 2021 in a food coma. Ho, 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 ho. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And Merry Christmas. Year. How are you, Stephen? Doing good. Uh, doing kind of being festive. Yeah, I know. It's it's Christmas. It's Christmas yeah. Eve. That's right. How can you not be festive? Yeah. In podcast land, this is rolling out on Christmas Eve. We're all sitting back in our lawn chairs on the roofs waiting for some fresh reindeer venison. That's it. Um, <laughs> Rudolph's dead. You know, yeah, you know. <laughs> we'll see how all that goes. Got the trail cameras all set up to catch Santa. That's it. Cookies are cooked. Laced. <laughs> <laughs> like Sasquatch, the one time a year he comes out. That's right. Well, I thank everybody for joining us here on Christmas Eve and listening to us absolutely blabble about nothing. But yeah, this is the the turning point for all of us where we know that there's only a couple of days left in the regular season for a lot of us because normally a lot of the seasons end what the first of the year, right? Yeah, so right around that first week of January. So what what is better than to open up another season like ice fishing? Sounds you, cold to me. Do you guys do you guys get a lot of ice fishing where you're from? In Arizona, no. No. <laughs> Virginia? <laughs> there's, there's none in Arizona. Uh Virginia, not that I have experienced. I'm sure it's possible. I haven't really looked into it because in my opinion, I think we're too far south to trust the ice. Yeah, That's I wouldn't me. do that. No. So, Bad news. Well, yeah. I guess you're gonna have to come up here then and do some ice fishing with us then. Yeah, get out on the hut, freeze my ass off drink some beers and catch some nice fish there's nothing wrong with that and there's all kinds of different fashions of doing so but we'll let the guest today take us on that tour of uh the real live way of ice fishing right we we're not the greatest ice fishermen i mean i'm personally not i used to ice fish a lot but uh not much anymore so yeah i've never done it so no this is another one of those new conversations for me it'll be fun and I'm sure if I go up there and do it with you, we'll get skunked you because understand. I'm with you. No, no, you don't. You don't. No, that doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, you're with me, dude. <laughs> yeah, this is true. This is true. We need to crack a lot of that as we, as we, I think this season and this year, we've definitely done so. Um, we've halfway broke the ice. We, we yeah. broke the Virginia curse. Well, we don't want to break no ice. We definitely do not want to break any ice. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Touche. This is, this is the truth of it. So. Steven, what what have you been into this week, man? What what's kind of going on in the world of uh, Virginia? So honestly, uh, in the world of Virginia, there's not a lot going on in podcast land. I am actually going to be in Arizona at the time this plays out, so it'll be the first time home in four years. Wow. Uh, we had a, a death in the family, so we're going to go. Sorry home for your loss. Appreciate it. Um, we're just going to go and enjoy. Uh, take the camera up get some some video at home to show everyone out here that Arizona is not all desert and that we do truly have the biggest elk in the world. Uh, but that's just me bragging. Watch me come back with no film either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I'm going to, I'm going to try to get some stuff to let everybody see, you know, kind of where I come from and what it's like and just enjoy as far as in real time right now in Virginia it's it's just been a grind man just working getting out when i can which has been kind of rare lately mm. and with the snowstorm that's supposed to hit us tonight i got my fingers crossed because like i told you earlier i've got the only standing greens in the valley and if we get two feet of snow i'm hoping those deer come up here to start digging turnips 
Is that is that what you guys are end up gonna end up getting? As yeah, they're, two feet. They're calling eighteen inches to two feet. Uh, wow. More often than not, I call the Weather Channel's bullshit as trying to excite more panic. We'll probably end. That's up just with, media in itself. Yeah, eight to twelve inches. Yeah, is about the most I expect. I think we're getting less than you, man. That's what we're getting. Is we're they're calling for eight to twelve. So we'll, we'll end up seeing what actually happens. I know a little bit obviously south is getting more so yeah yeah i mean the other day yesterday we ended up getting i don't know maybe a half inch on Mm -hmm. just a random fluke storm but they were calling for six inches so that's kind of how it goes yeah it's nuts i don't things here kind of been kind of crazy we got a little bit of snow it's been kind of cold uh tomorrow which uh in podcast real late i don't know tomorrow it's gonna be fucking cold <laughs> and uh so i'll be out goose hunting but the the i've been wing shooting a ton uh i got a good friend of mine chris brockett out who's actually a taxidermist that i uh hang out with and help out around his shop and whatnot and he's taught me a lot and you know just skinning and stuff so prepping good skins and question are you gonna try to do your own bird no fuck no. <laughs> i was gonna say man are you gonna no. dive right in no well so chris just does mammals so he does all of my white tails and stuff like that so he just he's needed help skinning so i just go over there and skin and prep i haven't nice. really i don't i'll never get into the actual art of taxidermy or that my never say never dude goals i ah. i said i would never come to the east coast and here we are <laughs> this is the truth but um but no we got we got out with danny uh, from Ducks on the Bay yesterday, and we hunted, and we absolutely slaughtered them. We had a great time. Uh, it was Chris's first time. We had Peter with us, Danny. Um, we shot a limit, as always. We watched the boys who are newer at it just absolutely swing and miss all day long. They went through about six or seven boxes of shells to shoot <laughs> the limit, so that was that was pretty entertaining. Um, yeah, learning that lead is an art in itself. And and I mean these. It's not easy at all. I mean, the boat's going like this. The bird's going like this. I mean, there's just a lot of movement and stuff and guys that don't know how to lead. And if you stop and you're not spraying, you just don't shoot the birds you should. Um, right. It's, they're, they're very resilient, too. Uh, they can take a lot. So if you don't hit them right, they're definitely not going to die. Um, but goose hunting has been phenomenal. They've been on the feed a metric ton. I've uh, been hunting a lot of green fields, and we've been doing very, very well. Uh, the one field that we do hunt, I have been hunting, uh, they're up to 74 for the season nice. on the field. So that was pretty cool. And we can only shoot two per person. So they've been hunting real hard. Um, and then tomorrow I'll be up in Massachusetts with another group of guys um, on a golf course, actually, in a country club. And uh, they've been doing really well. So they invited That's me over to play some world. <laughs> yeah. So I got invited over to hunt with those guys tomorrow. So we'll see what happens. Uh, I've been filming a metric ton. Um, it's just tough because you're only allowed to shoot two birds per person. So you can't, I mean, I, I really, I mean, what are you going to get for video of me just shooting my two birds? So definitely going to be a bunch of, uh, of uh, videos to B-roll, put together. Cut in. Yeah. Some. And just a ton of kill shots. I got to hunt like 25 times just to make a five minute video because you can only shoot two birds. So, right. Um, so we'll have that. That'll come soon. Once the season gets kind of underway here and I can get a bunch of footage and we'll hopefully put something together. Oh, but, for sure. But yeah, hunting's been crazy. The deer have been absolutely insane. I haven't had the time to get in the woods. I muzzleloader hunted a little bit. Um, and you're regretting that tonight. Okay. <laughs> yeah, always, man. Like constantly, like, the past couple of days, man. Like bucks have just been back on their normal patterns. Um, still kind of chasing does. There actually was a, a picture of uh, on the twelfth of uh, of a buck breeding a doe. So that was kind of cool to see. And uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> we'll we'll. Uh, I'll probably get on the ground tomorrow. I'll probably get back at it before the snowstorm, and then after the snowstorm, I'll hit the bait zone, start baiting up everything, and getting everything kind of ready. Uh, to kind of go hardcore and and shoot them over bait for the last month of the season because we can hunt an extra month down there. So right, it'll be good. And this will come out. It's now Christmas, so in the next couple of days, probably five days, Devin from Spy High Mountain 
Systems and his wife Ivy will be here in Connecticut. So they're coming up to hunt on the first, second, and third. So awesome. We'll have some cool shit going. So pumped for that. Good things going, man. Deer season's over and everyone goes, oh, now it's time to relax. Nope. Things nope. get fucking busier. <laughs> just, just switch seasons. <laughs> it's never ending. It never ends. So, but I think um, I hear something coming in. Is, is that the clinking and clanking of rain, rain gear? It almost sounds like it. What the heck? What is going on? Let me turn that shit up. Oh, there it is. Hey everyone, Mike here with some holiday news for your cruise. So for any of you last minute shoppers out there, um, me included, Vermont Fish and Wildlife has you covered for the perfect Christmas gift for anyone who hunts or fishes. Uh, you can now purchase gift certificates from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. Uh, these can be purchased online and must be redeemed online toward the purchase of any eligible hunting or fishing license. Uh, and the gift certificates are also transferable. Uh, so if you're looking for that last minute gift for your favorite news guy or get one you just aren't gonna use, uh, you know, just saying, I do love to hunt Vermont and I'd appreciate you looking out. So uh, moving on, uh, did you know that Santa's sleigh doubles as a bass boat? Cause I sure as hell didn't. Um, and apparently uh, he loves getting after some, some bass just before Christmas time. Uh, according to Ugly Stick who held Ugly Stick's world's largest Santa Claus bass fishing tournament last weekend in Lake Norman, uh, on Lake Norman in North Carolina. The bass tournament uh, boasted 300 Santas and raised over $15,000 worth of donations for Toys for Tots. So I guess Santa will have a few more toys in his sleigh this year, uh, thanks to all these great anglers that came out for this cause. So now with Christmas here comes probably the shortest hunting season of the year, the all-important reindeer season. So if you've been slacking, you still have a couple hours to get ready um, and see if you can uh, get those presets in on your chimney. Uh, and do not forget to hit up that local tractor supply or shields or whatever you have close by for that reindeer corn. Uh, that is, if you are in a bait zone. Unfortunately, my ass is not, and I can't go get that. But go find that green bag, that reindeer corn. Um, forget the general deer and wildlife corn. That's just, just not going to cut it this time of year. Uh, you need that green bag, that reindeer corn. Go get it. I hear supplies are running low. So go now. Only a couple hours left. Also, for reindeer season, you guys got to use all the tools in your toolbox pro tip what i'm hearing uh get on those santa trackers every new station has one the kids watch them they're easy to get to and it is the best shit since onyx i'm telling you you want to know when they're coming through this is going to tell you when they're going to be there so whether it's a chimney hanging bang or swinging from the saddle get up there and send it so and if you are lucky enough to punch that tag, um, send it on down to Trev. Well, but word has it, Santa's already dropping a pile of reindeer bone on him for the Beatles. So don't be surprised if your ass gets kicked to the back of the line, kind of like me. Um, but send it there. So that's it for your holiday news. I know I'm not funny, so go easy on me. Uh, and everyone have a very Merry Christmas. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your sleigh ride. Oh, Mikey, you never seem to amaze me, buddy. Thank you for the news <laughs> for your cruise, bud. <laughs> I guess I got a lot of work to do. Oh, man. Well done. Well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> oh, well, what do you what do you say, Stephen? You know, let's uh, spread some holiday cheer with some, well, it's kind of late if you're looking for gifts at this point, but maybe Santa will bring you a little something from uh, some of those people that support us. We hope so. Why so, don't you run them down? Timber tumblers. Hopefully somebody, your loved one, bought you a timber tumbler 
from Jason out at Timber Tumblers. You can check them out on Instagram and uh, and on our website. Uh, the uh, what is our website? Outdoor Drive dot com. Is it the Outdoor Drive? The Outdoor Drive dot com. The link right. is in the description. All right, perfect. So you can get on there and check out all of our sponsors. Get all the links to wherever you need to go, whether it is Timber Tumblers. Or it is Nor'easter Game Calls, nor'eastergamecalls.com. Go and check them out. Get them in close. Get all of your custom gifts for, uh, for all your loved ones over there. Uh, some cool things coming out uh, you guys will be able to see soon. Also, Broadside Camo, broadsidecamo.com. The photorealism camouflage. Wild Edge Inc., wildedgeinc.com, the leader in mobile hunting. They also have some really cool um, – Products coming out soon, the Battlement and their new saddle. Yes, also, um, Wicked Twisted Bowstrings, wickedtwistedbowstrings.com for all your custom bowstring needs. And who am I missing? Hmm, doing the head count. Using my fingers, I may have to use my toes. And when um, I get to my toes, I realize I'm wrong. Um, so, da, 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 that's all of them. Out on a limb. Limb manufacturing. <laughs> out on the limb MFG. How could I forget? I knew we were missing one because I didn't get to that last finger. <laughs> I try not to look in the handy dandy notebook, but um, out on the limb manufacturing. If you guys haven't checked them out, go check them out. It, and, you guys got to give Trev a break. He's on eggnog tonight. <laughs> I guess <laughs> it's actually a smoothie, but <laughs> we'll go with it. <laughs> Uh, that's funny i gotta get back on the diet because i know after the holidays um it's it never gets good when, oh, yeah. when you're eating all the craziness well of, you, uh, you eat and you sit in a duck blind and you eat and you sit in a duck blind and you eat while you're in the duck blind and you know you sit and <laughs> oh absolutely and then you're working in the shop and you're not really doing much not really moving around most of your hand stuff uh you know it's bad when your wife leaves cookies and candy all over the place in the house. And it's like, stop doing this because you know, they make the ones, the little ones with the, with the chocolate chip kisses in them, not chocolate chip, the, the chocolate kisses in the middle of the peanut yep. butter. And then you got the little tiny, um, shortbread ones that look like stockings and you got it's just stop doing that shit, dude. It's so annoying. Like I'm on a diet. I can't be eating that stuff. Stop drives me nuts and then there's always the you know the truffles and this that and the other thing and they have them in little dishes it's like i can't do this no more so and of course you grab a handful to go to the duck blind and and eat so yep and it is, but yeah i feel you yep um speaking of soon um on our youtube page me and steven been talking about it and we have something new coming up um uh, we're going to boost up a little bit more content on the YouTube side with um, two times a month um, product review type podcasts. So it'll be like a 30 minute video podcast with just uh, products or newer products that are coming with the manufacturers with the manufacturers. So we can kind of see. So we'll start off with our sponsors and we'll go through them and then we'll move on to other products. If there is a product that you want to see or potentially would like to share if you're like a product manufacturer uh, just reach out to us outdoor drive podcast at gmail.com or on any of our social media platforms we would love to talk to you um and have you on so if you guys have anybody in mind um get a hold of us and we will get in touch with them so yeah hopefully we can uh, get some good previews with you know all the big shows with ata with all the classics everything getting closed down Hopefully, this is a, a good alternative that we can get you information on products you're interested in. I did just learn that the um, Nebraska Deer Classic or whatever we want to call that one is still on. Iowa Deer Classic is still on. Wow. Okay. Hmm. I could have uh, just, I oh, know yeah, that was I the could. Illinois show that shut down, didn't it? Yeah. Well, Illinois and Iowa are the same person. That puts them on. Yeah, it just comes down to state regulations because of the, the freaking China virus. Yeah, so I guess that the Iowa Deer Classic's still on, so um, you may actually see our shining faces there. Possibly. It's a possibility. So. Unless Trev gets locked down in Connecticut. 
Oh, no. They, <laughs> I've been to so many other states and not had any problems, so I'm not really worried about it. I'm leaving whether they like it or not. So, <laughs> Fair game. Really care. I'm over it. Fair so. game. Well, well, let's get on somebody who wants to tell something way more useful than what we're about to talk about. I agree. I got a feeling that uh, I'm going to need to get a heated seat for this one because my butt's already cold <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's turn it on. All right, brother. Here we go. All right, we're back on the phone with Jason Mitchell. How are you, man? Good. Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to uh, – you're on the drive. Literally. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm riding shotgun, so, yeah, I'm not driving long. But yeah, we're just on our way home. We're out in Montana doing some fun uh, trout stuff through the ice. And, uh, yeah, just uh, that time of year where we're just getting out and about and you know, trying to find safe ice is probably the biggest thing, so. Right. Yeah, we were talking about that on the intro. Trev asked if there was any ice fishing in Virginia, and I said, even if there is, I don't know if I trust the ice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're a little you know, too far I, south. Yep. You know, three weeks ago, we, well, we've been ice fishing for about three weeks up where I'm at in North Dakota and places, but uh, you know, there's still some dangerous areas I just heard, and I don't know much about this tragedy, but evidently a younger kid died or drowned in Devil's Lake area yesterday. Fell through ice and it's still moving. I don't know much about it, but I've been ice fishing back home quite a bit and, and you know we've got six, seven inches of ice in places, but there's some really bad cracks and pressure ridges and things like that that create bad ice situation. I'm sure that's what he drove into. But uh mm-hmm. yeah, so I mean you definitely you know have to think safety first and foremost. Absolutely. Well before we get too much into it, why don't we turn this key and uh why don't you explain who you are, where you're from and, and what you do. Well, my name is Jason Mitchell. I live up in Devil's Lake, North Dakota. I guided up there for many, many years, you know, ice fishing, fishing, and waterfall guiding, and then uh, did that for about 15 years. And then about 12 years ago, I got the opportunity to get into the television industry. So I've been producing tel- outdoor television for the last 12 years. And uh, yeah, we just, you know, I guess our, our ammo would be that we just promote fishing, promote hunting opportunities, and uh, try to motivate people to get outside awesome absolutely and and where can they kind of find some of your content before we get too much into it well you know, on television we hear on fox sports north and fox sports midwest and then you know, station called midco but uh a lot of people watch your stuff on youtube you know, you know just streaming it online i mean I, I would guess that youtube or some type of video streaming online will you know, replace cable television as we go on Fairly soon. So. I agree. Absolutely. What's your, what's your channel on YouTube? Uh, Jason Mitchell Outdoors. You just search Jason Mitchell Outdoors and pop right up. Awesome. awesome. That's awesome. So so what have you been fishing for thus far throughout this season? Well, so far we filmed a, an early ice walleye bite on you know around Devil's Lake. That was the first episode ice episode that we produced for this season. And then we were over in northern Minnesota over by Park Rapids. And filmed a panfish, big crappies, really what we were catching. Then we caught some pretty nice bluegills. And we did that last week, and then now we're out in Montana here this week. And so we're just getting, like, northern Minnesota, there's a lot of places where you can ice fish. Um, you know, big parts of Wisconsin, you know, they're still not on the ice yet. So there's just a kind of a small area right now where we're seeing safer ice, you know, where people can walk out or, or take ATVs out or side by sides out. And then, you know, we've been ice fishing around home for quite a while but it's just been so nice during the day that we've been just stuck on you know, five six seven inches of ice for a long time normally you know people will be driving full-size vehicles on the ice by now but we're just had just a mild winter so far but it'll come so what do you, what is what is safe ice to you like when what would you recommend that somebody would start to go out on the ice well there's a, there can be a lot of variables and, and i think the biggest thing is do your own diligence in the sense that people will get a report, you know, ah, there's safe ice on such and such a lake. Well, yeah, there might have been for one person in one bay, but it could be different somewhere else. And so always do your own due diligence, you know. Uh, for myself, I like to have three inches of clear ice to walk on. Okay, there's people that will say less, but I'd say three inches of good ice to walk on. Uh, if you're taking, a, a say, a four-wheeler or a, a lighter side-by-side, some of these side-by-sides are going to be the weight of a small car 
for a snowmobile, you know, I, I recommend you know, six, seven inches, which is plenty. And for driving vehicles, I like to have 13, 14 inches of good clear ice. So there's charts and things that will say a little less, but you know, you know, it, you know, biggest thing though is making sure that you, you, know, you check the ice. So clear ice is obviously strong than cloudy ice. Uh, I like to have a spot bar that way I can chip the ice in front of me as I go, kind of make a trail, you know, like get out there and follow back. I always have my GPS on, so I've got my plot trail, you know, so I can take the exact route back, you know, and, and just, you know, be diligent, you know, be careful, you know, don't just cross cracks, you know, I mean, check them first, you know, and, and not only can those cracks be dangerous, but they can widen up or open up, and, you know, wind can change things, and so I think you just have to be observant and diligent, and you know, just kind of know what, what, what is safe and what isn't, and, you know, and, and not take any chances, Right. Are you carrying, like, what, what would you recommend for some safety gear for somebody to carry with them when they're out ice fishing? Well, I, I, you know, the suits that we're wearing now are, you know, the float suits. You know, I mean, I, I wear just a clam lift suit or rise suit. You know, that way if you do fall through, you, you fall, you, you, you float, okay? Uh, just having a throw rope, uh, just even having a screwdriver in your pocket, you know, or a lot of times we'll wear picks around our neck that we can pull apart and stick into the ice or poke into the ice. And, uh um, so ice cleats, I mean, realistically, if you're, if you're doing your due diligence, you're probably more likely to get hurt falling on the ice than you are falling through. Okay? And so ice cleats are important early ice when you're just walking out, you know. And, and stick with things that you know, you know. Uh, try to know a lake good enough where you can walk out a short distance from shore and be on a pretty good spot. Know if there's culverts, for example, or springs. Springs and culverts, bridges, causeways, moving water is always bad ice stay away from that stuff you know just you know there's some areas that are just develop good ice every year because of you know, the current lack of current or you know, protection and uh you know and if, if anything ask around you know go to your bait shops or tackle shops and you know find as much information as you can so that way you can make good smart decisions because ice fishing is a fun great activity to learn more and more people are getting it all the time the last 10 years i think it's been like the fastest growing segment the entire fishing industry it's very very safe but it's just like anything else right i mean bass fishing in a boat can be really dangerous if you don't use your head right oh, yeah and so it's like anything else you got to use your head and you got to you know ask the right questions so that way you, you know, you've got the information to go on so. gotcha. well, it's like deer hunting and getting up in the deer stand i mean it's always it's always dangerous every time you leave the ground but you make sure to wear the harness right so absolutely ice fishing. Same, same thing you, yes absolutely Good deal. So, so I guess why don't we why don't we take a break from kind of the safety side? Why don't you explain a little bit, you know, kind of like, you know, what what you do or what what your past and kind of with with fishing and and ice fishing and stuff. Yeah, well, what drove well, you to want to do it? Well, that's all I've ever loved. I mean, I I love fishing and uh, loved ice fishing, and uh, I kind of got lucky in the sense that I, I probably got started at the right time, you know, right place at the right time. You know, I was guiding on Devil's Lake when I started pretty young, and Devil's Lake just kind of blew up you know, right when I was, you know, really coming in my own as a young man, and I became a real famous, you know, fishing destination. I'm trying to, there I go, pop that sun, sun's <laughs> coming through the mirror there again. And uh, anyways, we were uh, just in the right place at the right time, and I love fishing, and I love taking people fishing, I guess, and I, and I I always joke, you know, guiding is that there's probably people that were way better at fishing than I was, but I think what I had going for me is I was patient. You know, people would do things wrong, they would break something, you know, lose a fish, whatever, and I just didn't get the girl worked up about it. And I was, I just found that I had a knack for that. I was patient to could deal with, you know, things that you know, probably annoy some people. And, uh, you know, this hot fish, you know, when we had to, and, started getting a lot of media attention and then that led to sponsorships and you know, some uh, relationships in the industry that way and just one thing led to another you know and so it's been a great ride it's all i've ever done my entire adult life is self-employed in the fishing industry so. that's awesome man how was it guiding like bringing people out and 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 that like what, what were some of the positives that you you kind of took away from that well I, you know Obviously, I love fishing, right? So I got to fish every day. I'm a phenomenal fisher. You know, the highs are highs and the lows are low. Um, but there's ups and downs. I mean, you get two or three tough days when the weather's tough. 
Uh, you get, you know, things going on where you know, maybe you get some people that uh, you're not meeting their expectations. You know, I mean, so not every day is rolls. You know, when you're a guy, you know, you're doing your day. I mean, there's, there's good and bad. You know, like, but uh, I loved, you know, showing people a great time fishing, you know, and, and you know, many, many times where, you know, they hadn't had great fishing before. They just didn't really know or they wanted to learn more about it, you know, and just go out there and just get it out of the park, you know, and, and then, you know, same people have come up every year, year after year, you know, there's groups like that in more than 10 years, you know, and watch their kids grow up and stuff, and every year they'd come out and, and you know, just have a great time, you know, and so I love that. I love, you know, just the, the relationships, you know, I mean, you have to also like people, you know, I, mean, I know some really, really good anglers that, you know, we've tried hiring some of them over the years that just didn't work out. Guy, yeah, I mean, they phenomenal anglers, but they didn't like people, you know, and uh, you have oh, to yeah. enjoy people too, you know, to, to be a guy. But I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, there's a lot of great stories from just, you know, taking people out, you know, experiencing some phenomenal fishing, you know, and, and just, uh, we got to see guys taking their kids out for the first time, uh, people taking their parents out for the last time, you know, a lot of in between, you know, and just a, just a really great experience for us. Nice. So I, I got to ask, during all that time, what was the craziest thing you ever experienced out there? Oh, man, there's so much because you're out there every day. And, I mean, you just you see, you see all kinds of Got a little technical difficulty here. He's still there. It's yep. it's trying. It's yeah. trying. <laughs> That's what happens when you're on the drive. I can yeah, I can I can oh. hear you guys fine. Okay. There you are. Gotcha. Yeah, you're, you're breaking back. up for a second. <laughs> so Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you one I'll tell you one crazy story that just pops up pops up in my mind. I mean there's a hundred of them, thousands of them, but I remember one time I'm driving across the lake and um, just going along I, and I see something way up on shore and it's really a windy day. It's you know, like 25 mile an hour wind. There's two and a half, three foot rollers going across the lake and I've got people in my boat. And I'm going along and I see this light green blue thing floating up on the shore. I, I couldn't tell. It was like, a, like one of those plastic swimming pools or what, but something was up on shore. Then I saw something waving. And huh. So I drive up to it. Well, here it's a boat swamp like an old boat like an old fiberglass boat that's probably 14 foot long and they had motor trouble and normally you know i mean you know sometimes my stuff isn't always jib type shape or uh what's the word uh ship shape okay i i have it's two guys that are in trouble they're waving and so i pull up and i gotta throw a rope to them to try to pull them off the rock until they get completely destroyed by the waves and so I, I take my anchor rope. Normally there's all kinds of knots in and all kinds of stuff, whatever. And it was almost like a miracle where one threw the rope. I threw the rope and landed there. He landed where they could grab it. And then they tied it off to the boat. And then they pulled. And I pulled the boat, bow the boat into the wind with my boat, and they were able to get the water out of it. Well, then I pulled them back to the resort. Well, I ended up guiding those guys for like two or three days after that's so worked out great. Right? I feel like the rest of the week. You know, this is when I was young. I was like 21, 22 years old. Just trying to keep going, trying to get where I was going every day, you know. And I mean, you know, uh, saved a lot of people, you know, as far as pulling boats back to the shore, finding boats that were about sunk, or you know, I, I came by the lake one time, I by the lake one time in, in, a, in a really bad storm, you know, it was so bad. I mean, it's just like my face pushed up against my GPS, just trying to get home. I couldn't see hardly anything. This really freaked me out, and the rains beat me in the face and stuff, and I just Know, just trying to get home, and I look up, and right in front of the boat, there's an upside down aluminum boat floating in the water, and, and it just blended right in. I mean, I, I barely saw it, and I, I it just, you know, the, and there's like three, four foot waves, and we're just getting battered, you know, we have, we have to go into crosswind and stuff, and we're just getting beat up, and uh, I, I just freaked me out, so I didn't know if anybody's in the water or what, and when, then when we slowed down to try to assess the situation, we just got you know, doused, you know, with waves and come out with a bow, uh, hit the bow and stuff and just a ugly day. Well, here, nobody got hurt, but 
that boat got flipped over and swamped, and then the people end up swimming to shore. By then, the you know, highway patrol and everything already been blown out there and stuff. But I didn't know that. I just came, you know, driving up on that boat. <laughs> Freaked me out. But uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. a lot of stuff like that over the years, you know. Crazy. It's nuts. So I I work on a charter fishing boat here in uh, Connecticut, and we're on the ocean all the time. And it's crazy the stuff that people do and, and that they would go out in the ocean with these small boats and get swamped or flip over or yeah. whatever. I mean, I, I remember this one time we were coming in and there's this place that's called the race. And it's like one of the most dangerous places in New England on, you know, because it's where the Atlantic meets the Long Island Sound. And it's like 300 yeah. feet and it comes up and it's just these high currents. So this guy had like a 14 foot flat bottom skiff boat and he's out there. And he ends up getting caught in a lobster pot and it flips the boat around and it completely swamps it. And it's completely over on end. Well, he had his 14 year old son with him at the time at, thank God oh. it was the weekend and there was a ton of people out there, but you just see it all the time. These people just, they don't have a clue what's going on. And I can only imagine being on big lakes. It's almost the same. Yeah. Just, they don't know. You know I mean, it, it, uh, they don't respect it. You know, I mean, and the thing is, too, is that accidents can happen to anybody. I mean, one, one, uh, you know, 50 cent fuse in your motor, where you're, you're losing power, trim, and your motor trims up, and you know, you turn into a bad day. You know, things pile on top of each other. You know, so I guess I, you know, there's been times where I've needed help too. I, I can never drive by somebody and not help them. So there's plenty of times where people can help me. You know, and, and uh, yeah, he is, you do it up every day. You see everything. That's for sure. Yeah. It's nuts, but it's fun, man. It's it's what keeps you going back, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. So, as far as like ice fishing goes, man, when you when you're going to dissect a lake and you're gonna go say a new new body of water that you've never fished before, what kind of things are you looking for? Like, are you looking for a structure? Are you looking for like say when you're walleye fishing, for example? What what do you what are you looking for? Well, first off, I'm looking for fish in the sense that I I like to go to lakes that have a lot of fish. In them, okay. I mean, I get 20, I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, I probably get 20 emails at least, and maybe, you know, just as many messages on social media each week, you know, about, you know, hey, I live in Bullhead Lake in southern Iowa, I've got a cabin there for 30 years, and I've never caught a wall over 20 inches, can you help, what am I doing wrong, you know, and they're like, well, you got to go to a different lake, <laughs> you know, and so <laughs> that's the big thing, right, is you got to, you know, I like to try to find lakes and just to have a lot of fish, you know, you're just cycling and trending in the right direction. You know, some lakes are hot, some lakes aren't. So, you know, you try to you try to land on good lights that way. Uh, I try to gather as much information as I can about the lake before I bring it there. You know, by just calling people that I know or calling people that I know that, you know, put in time on the water, just try to get an idea. Because every lake sets up so differently. I mean, we have flat, shallow, basin lakes that have no structure that are no less than no deeper than 10 feet and there's other lakes that have a lot of structure that are 100 feet deep you know like one lake might have you know invertebrates as the primary forage or young of the year perch while the other lake might have tuna beads or siskels or something but cool water aging bait fish you know uh reservoirs can fish completely different than natural lakes you know and, and the fish that relate to beads are completely different than the fish that are on the structure and on top of that you know you've got you know stained water versus clear water you know so there's so many different variables that really affect where you where you think you're going to find fish. And so I try to gather as much of that information as I can before I ever go anywhere. At least I can try to wrap my head around, you know, look at maps and things like that, and just try to, you know, uh, you know just get an idea. And then from there, you know, once you get on a body of water, you know, obviously, you're, you know, a lot of times with walleye fishing, it's, it can be very structure orientated and um, you know, a lot of times you'll see where people have been catching fish where they've, where they've been fishing. And what I find is that if you join the crowds, you know, after, after you know, people have been on that spot for a day or so, you know, the spots only get worse. You know, so I like to try to find my own fish and do my own thing and be the first person on the spot. So a lot of times I'll just try to find areas and try to identify things that look similar where it looks like people have been catching fish that people just haven't gotten to yet, if that makes any sense. And usually the first people to land on fish, you know, especially in the wintertime, you know, first of all, about those fish are some of the best holes that by the time a crowd gathers, you know, the bite typically gets harder and harder and worse and worse. Gotcha. 
So do you do a lot of night walleye fishing or a lot of day walleye fishing? Do you find one's better than the other? or? You know, I like to fish them during the day if I can. You know, I'm like anybody else. I like to go to bed at some point, you know. But I love to fish at night if that's what it takes. But there's some lakes, a lot of lakes, where you have to fish after dark. It's just the way it is. Um, not always. I mean, like where I live on Devil's Lake, you catch fish during the day. Lake in the woods, you catch fish during the day. Lakes that have some type of stain or color in the water, you can fish a lot better during the day. In most lakes, even if they're really clear, you know, you've got that sunrise, sunset window that really is you know, one of the prime times, you know, but there's some lakes where you just, you know, and if you're going to, if that's going to happen randomly throughout the night, you know, I tell you what, some of the most successful people are sleeping out when they have a hard sided fish on the rattle reels down. They wake up when they get a reel and drag a fish, and, you know, so that, you know, you can't understand how effective that can be at times either. So, I mean, there's times where we have to fish after dark, but a lot of times we find that mornings and evenings on most bodies of water, we can get it done. So, so how about like pan fishing? So what kind of things are you looking for when you're pan fishing? It's, is it, it, well, it's obviously close and same as walleye fishing, but. Yeah, very similar. I mean, you've got weed lakes, you've got you know, weed bites, which are typically shallower. And you've got, you know, the other pro- primary patterns, you know, the deep holes or, or holes where people are fishing with winter to spend over. Then you've got your, you know, your soft bottom mud basins that you can hold a lot of pan fish too, because that's typically where you're going to find a lot of invertebrates. And so those are kind of the basic broad stool, broad brush patterns that you're going to find in fish. You know, and obviously, bluegills and crappies, a lot of times will be from the same areas or general areas. Sometimes they'll be found pretty close together. You know, the yellow perch, they can be doing their own thing. It's hard to find lakes that have good perch, bluegill, and crappie fishing. It's like usually, you know, if one's good, the other one isn't, you know, but uh, it, like our perch lakes out in the Dakotas fish completely different than the perch lakes in Minnesota or Wisconsin, you know. And that's what I think makes panfish so fun for me and, and all fishing is that you, know, you have the same fish when you go four or five different states and, and you have just such different ecosystems, different fisheries, different bodies of water, completely different forms, pieces, different structures, and different water color. And each lake, each each lake will have its own personality. It'll fish so much differently than the lake that's three miles down the road, you know, and so it's um, and, and that's probably what I enjoy the most about fishing is seeing all these differences. So are you fishing a lot like on the jig rod or you run traps too? I run a lot of jig rods. I mean, I, I like to move around and everybody has their own style. I like to be pretty aggressive where I'm just one rod, one vexilar, and you're just, they're not beneath me. No. I find that uh, multiple rods, head sticks, chip downs, what have you, can be really, really effective, uh, especially if you know where the fish are and you know that that's where you're going to be and what you're going to be. Um, but if, for big parts of the day, if you, if you don't know that, every time you make a move, you just got to pick up more stuff. You know, in the fishery, they're there. The, you know, there's either activity and signs of life. And whatnot. So I pour a one rod, trust my electronics, and go, go, go until I, until I find them. There are times where I've seen it over and over, you know, especially like the perch and sometimes the crappies too, especially where, you know, just off victim light and, you know, at the end of the day, a, a small, tiny minnow of a plane hook and a split shot on a, on a tip down or a dead stick will catch fish with nothing else will. You know, there's just times where you have, especially sometimes we have low population densities of fish and lots of forage, lots of stuff for these fish. That can create some really tough bites because these fish aren't aggressive. They don't have to work for a meal. And with canned fish especially, you know, there's times where that type of bite or that, that dead stick saves the day. If you're gonna want to run one dead stick, you might as well run as many as you think you can. You know, so that's that's a strategy at times. But you know, most lakes, most bodies of water, where I'm just trying to find fish and catch fish, it's just one rod and people just moving around and jigging. Yep. yep. So the other with jigging too is you can pull fish in from a lot further away too. You know, so you increase the water you cover by not just going from hole to hole. But fishing aggressively enough where you can pull fish in from several feet away, you know, and that's the thing is, you know, you just worry about finding the aggressive fish, finding the easy fish, and then when you catch those fish, then you can always lighten up, drop down, downsize, 
use more live feed, you know, dead sticks, things like that to catch the hard fish. You know, when starting out, I like to try to, you know, my whole mindset is catch the easy ones, find the easy ones. Those will slow you down for you to spend more time to figure it out for us. So if you were to put together, like, a box of, like, a good amount of jigs, what would you recommend? Do you like you like having an assortment of all things like more like tungsten teardrops or a lot of like the Rapala dancing stuff or what do you, what do you think is I I don't carry a lot of capital to be honest with you. I mean I could I could fit everything that I would need into a you know a wheel cup. I mean I, you know I, I love using the horizontal tungsten jigs. I think they move a lot of water they they uh, with a soft plastic profile like I'll say like a Number, like just a number 12 or a number 10 drop jig or tungsten with a say a Mackie or a poly plastic just to some type of profile these fish can see. Now are there times where you need to finesse from that and throw it out? That absolutely. But I like to start out with the heavy tungsten to horizontal and lose water and these fish can see from a long ways. Now when fishing is tougher I find that I'm better off switching to a vertical jig like a teardrop a half hand something that's vertical so I think what happens is if you can imagine I'll see if I can hold my hand that vertical jig when the fish are it up at it's a lot smaller profile than what a horizontal jig is and so it moves less water less water it's just more subtle than the water and so I've seen that over and over especially on bluegills on a tough bite just going back to that classic vertical teardrop style made you know, typically wax burns is still a go-to but for finding fish covering water breaking down water fast, that horizontal jig with the plastic just really shines. And a lot of times I catch the biggest fish on there because what I find is that when you're looking for fish, a lot of times you can sort fish by size by fishing way up high, way up above the pack, and force those fish to get up to you and climb the elevator up to see you. Okay? And say if, you're, if you can get fish to go up, say, two, three, four, five feet from the pack, the fish that are going to get their first are usually the bigger fish. The smaller fish are a lot more timid. They don't like to leave the security of the rest of the school. So that's one way to catch bigger panfish, especially bigger crappies, is to get a bubble and force those fish up to you. And the ones that get to you first are usually the biggest fish. And so that being said, you know, you need to have profiles that those fish can see from say three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten feet away to cause that. If you're fishing a little small finesse, you're not going to get those fish to rise because they can't see them far enough away. If that makes any sense. And so that's one you know try and true trick to catch bigger pan fish is that horizontal profile get above them and force those fish up to you. So you, you brought up a really good point with with feeding with crappies and stuff. Don't you want to fish on top of them anyways because they're an up feeding fish? Usually, yeah. I mean sometimes I mean every day you know it can be different. I mean sometimes the bluegills will be on top and the crappies will be on the bottom. You gotta get some these small bluegills get them down the crappies. I mean we've seen that you know all kinds of times. There's other times where they're all together and the crappies are on top. By and large, on, on most lakes, I mean, I don't care if it's upstate New York or Wisconsin, Minnesota, most places, you know, across the winter, if you want to catch bigger crappies this winter, just fish high in the water pump, much higher than what feels normal. And you won't, it isn't the sure thing every day. I mean, nothing is in fishing, but over the course of the winter, I guarantee that you'll catch more big fish by just getting up higher in the water pump. Say if uh, you're fishing 50 feet of water, and most of your fish are say three to five feet off the bottom, get 10 feet off the bottom. You'll get get up higher, and by and large, that's how we catch a lot of bigger fish. That's awesome. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. That's that's a really good tip. I'm sure you you sure you want to give that one out. So when you, when you, I, I know I'm kind of going through them, but like with perch fishing, what, what are some of the tricks and tips that you, you could give for, for when perch fishing? Well, same thing. I mean, every, you know, perch are such a, uh, amazing fish to me because they're so adaptable. I mean, perch that are, uh, say the Finger Lakes in New York, compared to say Great Lake estuary perch versus say fish in Northern Minnesota or a flood in Wisconsin, I mean, each fish, it's almost like a different species, how different they can handle. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, you know, our fish out of the Dakotas, you know, they're eating a lot of invertebrates. They're eating a lot of freshwater shrimp. They've got these big, huge bellies, small, tiny heads. They have a mouth that's the size of a Coke bottle. 
and it's really a finesse bite where these fish are used to eating these tiny little bugs that have no eyes that can't get away. Okay. Whereas you look out at say even like northern Minnesota, and you see like on Saginaw Bay, wherever where these fish are eating shiners, these fish you know have these big bodies, but they have these huge heads, mouth of bats, you know, and they have no trouble tearing apart a gray fish or eating a four or five inch shiner middle. I mean they're, they're just a lot more aggressive by nature. You know, their environment makes them that way, you know. And so everywhere you go, you know, birds fishing can really be different. Um, but again, you know, if you're well, key with perch fishing most of the time is finding them. I mean, you find them, you know, they're not well, usually a hard fish to catch. Sometimes they can be, but uh, finding them is a key. And so, you know, be aggressive, be mobile, lots of holes. You know, um, if you're in clear water, don't be afraid to space your holes out. You know, don't drill your holes too five, six, seven, ten feet apart when you can you have excellent water visibility because the fish can see you where you're at and also see you when you're five feet away. So spread your holes out in the open water, and the fish, you know, spoons, you know, something's got a flash, and these fish can see from a long ways. And don't be afraid to get that slip off the bottom. You know, even if these fish are coming in on the bottom, don't be afraid to bring it up three, four, five, six, seven feet, because those fish can see that from so much farther away. And that's the whole thing, is you might have a pack of fish running 20, 40 feet away from you. And it's amazing how many times you can bring those fish over to you, you know, by just fishing high so they can see it. Once you get those fish below you, then it's just a matter of getting up and getting back down fast. And if you have friends, people fishing with you, that's when you want to have your holes close together because then these perches, like they have attention deficit disorder. If you are out of the water and looking at the fish, remaining your boat, messing around, and say a minute goes by, those fish might be 50 feet away already. Whereas if you have somebody fishing, you know, dropping a line down, you can keep those fish underneath you for long. You know, so that's the thing is be aggressive. Fish that those fish can see and find you. Focus on finding the fish, and when you do, make it count because those fish are going to wait around forever. That's awesome. That's actually makes makes absolute perfect sense. I always wondered that, like when you're down there, and then they disappear, and then they show back up on the electronics, and you're like, "What the hell just happened? They just disappeared." <laughs> yeah, you brought them back. You know, brought them back. So, That's crazy. Sometimes too, I mean, it's different schools of fish, and sometimes you just have to run traffic where you're just on their trails. I mean, being on a deer trail in a tree stand. I mean, that, that's something with fishing, too, is it's almost like these fish are following an edge or following a trail, a transition, maybe, or maybe they're swimming in a circle, you know, where you catch fish and they leave you, and then 40 minutes later, they get around to the end of the circle, and you're there underneath you again, and you just have to sit and wait. You know, that's, you know, after you found fish, when you can find that spot, you got to drill a lot of holes. And then you just stay right on top of them. Well, if it works, right? I mean, you, you do it till where you wear all your welcome, you know. I mean, you know, a lot of times you you make big moves to find fish and then small moves to catch fish. So then what what you're saying is you kinda of recommend so if you're on fish to put put a ton of holes in one area and fish that area and then move. Yeah, I mean if it's working, they absolutely you know and, and sometimes too you just wear out the well the welcome and fish are right below you and move you know, twenty feet away, thirty feet away and there's a new group of fish underneath that hole, you know, and so yeah, I mean, a lot of times, it, usually the fishing gets tougher the longer you sit in a spot. Well, some of us, you really have a lot of patience, you just wait for a whole new school of fish to show up. You know, when you first drop down on fish, usually the first ones are the easiest, and it gets harder and harder as you come up above. So, you know, it just depends on how much patience you have. You know, I mean, I, I like to move around when I catch enough, you know, fill it on the hole, try some, just like making a cast, you know, you're not catching them, reel up and make another cast. Mm-hmm. You're not catching up here, well, let's go down the bank away. Let's go far the lake and make more cash. You know, that's kind of the way I look at it. So. Uh, what kind of uh, electronics are you using while, while you're out ice fishing? I'm a big fan of the Vexlar. Um, it's just, you know, it's a flasher. You know, and it's analog, so it's very real time. You get a lot of information in the signal, which is what I like. And I think what, why we're so popular with these angles. You know, I think some people look at flashers like it's outdated technology and i remember you know yeah 35 years ago having a public super 60 on the boat that was pretty amazing at the time or amazing now you know this is high tech then you know but uh, that analog signal though was, was so crucial because you know in the summertime or open water when you're in a boat that boat's moving you can have waves uh, you know transport boats going up and down the waves and if you didn't have that digitized signal it'd be really hard to interpret what you're looking at and so you look at a, at a digital signal of the sun.
summer, and it's it's what you want because it's, it enables you to put, you can put filters on that signal. For example, get a nice mark indicating a fish, right? And you ever notice how that's kind of speed sensitive, where if you're just sitting in one spot, you don't get those arcs anymore. If you go too fast, you don't get the arcs. Well, the thing about that analog signal is that you still have all that raw information. Whereas when you digitize that signal, put those filters on it, you lose information. So that analog signal is very real time. But the best thing about it is it's very, very good at showing or displaying the fin. And so you can look at blind spots with the computer blind spots at the bottom of the cone angle. If you have rocks or in the edges of the cone angle, if you have an uneven bottom, for example, things that would normally hide fish, you know, you can see that movement. Then you can read the body language of the fish so much better. And then those fish a lot of times don't change from popular body posture when they get ready to strike and you just see that signal flutter. You know, so that's that's really why you know, so many people like to use Vexlon. Gotcha. No. We no. got a question, Steve. No, no I was, <laughs> like, I, I was, I, I'm, I'm sucked in. I'm just kind of yeah. along for the ride at this point. It's, I know it coming from Virginia. There's not very much ice fishing. Yeah, this is all new Arizona, to me. So, so I'm just taking it all in. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, I'm from New England, so there's a lot of ice fishing to be done here. And I know the past couple of years have been kind of tough for us. We haven't had much of an ice fishing season, but I feel that we'll have one here. It's going to start probably in the next couple of weeks, at least the next week or so. We're getting real cold and things are always pretty good here. So, so what's your personal favorite fish to fish for? Oh, man, man. I don't know. I love them all. <laughs> And walleyes have always been kind of a soft spot. You know, I love to fish for bass. You know, I love hand fish. I, I don't know. I, mean, I haven't done a lot of fly fishing. Uh, I was, I would guess I'd probably have to say walleye fishing because that's what I've done the most of it. Probably what I feel the most comfortable doing on the top most common with that. But uh, I, I've never wanted to be a fish snob either. Where I, I'll try anything just once. But say walleyes. Gotcha. You're not only a hardcore fisherman, you're also a hardcore hunter also. Oh, yeah. I love hunting. Yeah. How was your deer season? Still hunting. Yeah. I, mean, I shot a couple of deer this year. I shot a really nice uh, mule deer out in Wyoming. And uh, shot a deer with my son here earlier this year in North Dakota. But, uh, yeah, I'm still bow hunting. So, yeah, I love bow hunting here. Bow hunting here at home is probably one of my most favorite things in the world, so. It's a little cold back home to be deer hunting still. Well, the problem is it hasn't been cold enough. I mean, the deer are kind of scattered. They're not coming into food like they normally should be. It's just kind of nice. And so when it gets, you know, even late in the year, um, you know, you start getting below zero. I mean, the hunting people get better off food sources. And uh, you just haven't had that. I've getting any trail camp things lately in the of the year. Just been kind of, just kind of waiting on the weather to get I think I think you'll get it here soon. <laughs> yeah, it, oh, yeah. it put a foot of snow on me today, so it's yeah, headed up. We got a pretty pretty bad uh, snowstorm here in uh, on the East Coast, but I have a close friend of mine that's in North Dakota also, and he said that it was pretty cold there. He said it was like yeah, 13. well, just, yeah, last couple of days it's definitely got cold. That's awesome. So what kind of things do you have coming out for this coming up season? Well, you know, just at the end of the day, we try to be opportunist. You know, try to just go where there's good fish and have them. There's good bites. We try to plan too much too far ahead. It doesn't work out that way. Um, I know there's been some good perch bites going out of northeast and south Dakota, so we're trying to get down that way soon. I'd like to try to get the lake with some of some walleye stuff here fairly soon this winter. Um, I doubt we're going to be able to get into Canada this winter. But I love going up there and fishing with lake trout and doing some different things up there, like Lake Winnipeg, where big walleyes. But uh, I doubt that's going to happen. Uh, and then, you know, some places, you know, we try to do every year, but a lot of places, like we just filmed something on Fort Peck recently, so probably won't we'll be back for this winter because of that. But I love, I love that place, especially for the lake trout. I mean, in my mind, it's one of the best lake trout ice fishing over 50. Uh, yeah, I mean, love to look. I mean, there's, I, I'd love to get back up to Cascade, you know, Cascade, Idaho, with those big perch. We did that last winter. We just had an unbelievable time. And so 
to both of the veteran field, but uh, I'd like to try to go to Wisconsin a little bit and do some stuff there. Yeah. I mean, we were kind of like a tumbleweed. We just kind of hauled them in. There's some good fish reports where you know, a few people call and hey, you know, they got money scattered all over now at this point. You know, people that I fish with, people that I trust, as far as just having good network information. So we get a lot of intel that way. And sometimes people catch fish and they're foolish enough to put it on the social media. <laughs> right? <laughs> Which yep. we all do. I'm, not, I'm saying that tongue in cheek, but, uh, you know, if something keeps popping up or something pops up that's kind of interesting, like, oh, we've never done that or filmed that or shown that, then you know, try to, try to mobilize and get on it. So, so you, you're just driving home from where? Minnesota? You were up there trout fishing? Montana. Montana? How was that? What, what, what were you guys, how'd that go? It was really cool. I mean, it was, we had a good time. We got some really nice fish, beautiful fish. I mean, just gorgeous colors on it. We couldn't build up for your trout. And then you look up and you're surrounded by these beautiful mountains. It's like a bull's Oh, another dead Must spot. Have hit a, another dead spot. <laughs> Went behind a hill. There he, he's coming back now. It's great freeze frame. Uh, kind of a high mountain, and uh, yeah, it was really neat. Yeah, here I can that's awesome how do you go about lake trout fishing what is, what is that what's the difference between that to what you were doing kind of like in montana well so where we were at in montana you know, we were fishing say 12 to 14 feet of water basically along weed lines it was very very similar to how you fish bluegills and crappies i mean uh we were using a flash or a spoon and then putting a six pound dropper below the spoon, which that's maybe 15 inches that we tie up, like a size 12 or a size 14, just a small, tiny jig, usually orange, pink, or red. Big it's on a basis, but really a light bite. It's not very more similar than you can fish than, you know, probably anything. Lake trout can be a whole different deal. A lot of times it's a lot deeper water. Might be say 30 feet, might be shallow, although I have caught them in the last water places and times. Um, but you might be 120 feet of water, so you're a lot deeper. At times, you might be dealing with currents, you're dealing with you know, bigger uh, profiles, bigger spool, whether it's a swim or whether it's a tube jig, whether it's a flutter spool. And you know, sometimes you're dealing with current, uh, you know, these fish can. Follow you up a long ways. So, a lot of times it's not just a little quiver and then a little tiny tap of a bite. It's it's big rips. It's, you're moving it up 10 feet up to the water column. You see a fish chasing you. The thing with lake trout is they're programmed to be one of their predator. Um, if sometimes I think it was a mistake people make fishing lake trout is not pulling the lure away enough or making them look fishy aggressively enough to cause the fish to chase. So, if you have a fish that comes in, comes out, comes in, it's all over you. You know, a lot of times you just have to reel and get that lure to you know, get away from the fish. And then that's when the lake trout will come up and hit it. You know, it was like the activator causal reaction, you know. And so uh, lake trout, when they're on, they're the most ferocious apex predator on the planet through the ice. But they can also be off. They can also be figuring where they'll come in, bump it, come in, come hit and run, hit and run, come in, look at it, leave. And sometimes you just have to wait out those windows where, you know, the apex predators not, not, not like you're going to catch them all day, you're going to catch 50 fish in a day. You know, you might have one hour window where those fish are just on, and you might get four bites through that window. You know, one of them might be a 30 pound fish. And so it's kind of a different mentality. It's probably more close to resembles musket fishing in a way as far as what you're trying to do to get one bite, and then understanding that you have to wait out those windows where those fish are making good because they're not eating every day, all day, every hour. That makes any sense. Absolutely. For sure. So I got I got one question for you, man. What drives you yeah. outdoors? Oh, I don't know. I don't like to be indoors. 
<laughs> I like that. Yeah, that's a great actually, answer. That's actually a great answer. We get a lot of different answers, and I guess that's a really good one. Like, like, I, I don't like being inside. Oh, he's breaking out. There, he's back. There he goes. Yeah, I, I, we, so we get a lot of answers like, oh, my, you know, the passion of this or my grandfather, but being outdoors because <laughs> you don't like being indoors, that will do it. We lose him again? No, no we're good. Still there. So, I guess, is there anything that you want to leave the guests with that, uh, you know, <laughs> oh, you're freezing again. Is there anything you well, kind of want to leave yeah, the people with? You guys. Gotcha. Hear me now? Yep, you're good. Okay. You're probably the biggest thing I'm seeing, you know, the measure of the COVID-19 world is that there's more and more people getting outside hunting and fishing, which is awesome. I mean, as far as the outdoor community, I hope that we uh, open, you know, welcome anybody into that, into our fraternity of open arms. Uh, but at the same time, too, you know, what people are seeing is that, you know, sometimes there's a lack of respect for people, you know, and sometimes people are maybe getting into this for the wrong reasons, you know, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, some beautiful person on Instagram that's, you know, uh, <laughs> just trying to get clicks or, you know, somebody that's just being really rude at the boat ramp. And so I always try to encourage people to, to find that passion or that love for the outdoors. But also, too, to respect the resource, respect the industry, and, and do things for the right reasons. And um, because that's the thing is, you know, we can't we can't create any more public land, we can't create any more public water. We have to do a better job of being stewards, of being you know, and treating each other better. So that way, there's enough opportunities for everybody to get out and, and have a, a quality experience. Amen gotcha. on that. That's yeah. that's the truth. I I think. I think that's, you know, that's a, a rabbit hole that we might not want to go down, but. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're saying. <laughs> but the, the, there's just too many people that are out there just not, not respecting one another. And especially, you know, now that the license sales have kind of been up because of COVID and everybody's out there, you know, I always said this was the sportsman people, hunters and fishermen are the most respectful people no matter what. But it seems that some of that's kind of the, tables are starting to turn and i think that people yeah, need to kind of respect not everybody them. yeah i mean most people are but i do want to be before you ever marry your daughter off or go to visit somebody go deer hunting with them for four or five days or fish in a tournament with them you can find out everything you need to know about the person you know and so you know yeah i mean not everybody's a saint you know i mean that's the reality is that not everybody is but uh i think most people are pretty good people and that's one of the things i enjoy about this industry is that they you deal with hunters and anglers and Right. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, one other quick question I wanted to run by you coming up. You know, you got Christmas. Do you have any uh, Christmas traditions in the outdoors that you want to pass along? Well, I don't know. Usually the kids come home from school and uh, they were trying to, you know, do something outside. My son has really fallen in love with traveling. So he is just crazy about trapping, and it doesn't matter what it is, muskrat, bait, raccoons, coyotes, whatever. So I know that when he's off from school, that we're going to be doing some of that stuff. You know, but uh, other than that, you know, we just the biggest things we're all together. You know, I'm on the road quite a bit, so you know, Christmas break, Christmas vacation, trying to be at home and just be home to be a dad and a husband. So I'm looking forward to that. Awesome, that is great to hear, and uh, I'm sure you're going to look forward to that after all the time on the road. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, again, we can't thank you enough for jumping on here for sharing some of your expertise. And uh, it's definitely not a topic that's been really touched on in the podcast world. So, again, thanks for sharing it. I hope a lot of people uh, listen to this and it piques their interest. I know mine is. Uh, Trev, I'm going to yeah, put you to work. So, well, we appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, guys. Hey, anytime want to miss you or we, miss you <laughs> yeah i hope i miss you <laughs> but i want to wish you and your crew there a merry christmas and hope you guys have a safe rest Take of your care. ride and uh for all the listeners same to you merry christmas we hope this is 
an absolutely incredible time of year for you and your families. Um, if you know someone in need, give them a hand. If you're in need, let somebody know. You know, there's no need to be in it alone. And in the meantime, thanks for taking the ride right here on the Outdoor Drive. There's Christmas dinner, boys and girls. Here comes a shooter. Shooter. Big buck. Well, I'll be at Rudolph himself. Get the camera. If that ain't Santa, I'm shooting. What would you like for Christmas? The Dirty Point Buck. <laughs> that ought to do it. If we shoot anything else in this intro, we're going to start 2021 in a food coma. Ho, 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 ho. Merry Christmas.